there is two, out two outcomes divided by uh, six possibilities, so that's just one third. <clears throat> okay, good. Now, we have a, one more example. So let's say you are sitting in a computer store. Oh no, it's a, no yeah, you're sitting in a university bookstore, and some people are buying laptops and desktops. And let's furthermore assume <coughs> that um, if the next guy buys a laptop, you call your random variable one. If he buys a desktop, you call your random variable zero. Uh, what's next? So um, now let's assume furthermore that 20% um, of all purchases during that week select a laptop. Then the probability mass function for x is this. So the probability that he will choose a desktop computer, the probability of zero, so that's the probability that, the, that our random variable x takes the value zero, is actually the probability that the next customer purchases a desktop model. Right? We're given this information. We know 20% of people select a laptop, and they select one of the two things. Right? They either select a laptop or they select a, a desktop. So then the probability of him choosing a desktop is 80%. Every other outcome is zero. Right? So th there's only two, two options here. Right? You either purchase a laptop or a desktop. So if that's you know, all the, all the cases that we, that we, um, that we uh, consider, then you know, if x is something different than 0 or 1, it has to be 0. So we can write this in a nice way, right? We can say, okay, the probability of x is 0.8 if x is 0, it's 0.2 if x is 1, 0 if x is neither. So actually, should be a bracket. Right? Should, should be nice. ah, so let me try. What else? So now we can we can put this in a little graph, right? We can say, okay, these are our two outcomes, 0 and 1, and this is the probability of these two. Any questions? No. Good. Okay, so what do we have here? So, um, ah, yeah. So now this is our, this is what we found out, right? In our last example. Now, this is a Bernoulli random variable, right? It can only take values zero and one. That's what we said in the beginning. Now, you can describe any Bernoulli random variable as alpha and 1 minus alpha. Why? Because the sum of those two probabilities equals 1. Right? So, if 1 is alpha, so if you sum this guy plus this guy, you get 1, right? Alpha, let's do it. So, 1 minus alpha plus alpha will just be 1, right? So there we are. So that's, so that's clear, right? So if, if this probability is 80%, then this has to be 20. <coughs> okay, so there we are. So we can say the probability of x given our parameter alpha is simply 1 minus alpha if x is 0, or alpha if x is 1, 0 otherwise. Make sense? Or no sense. Good. So, um, ah, each choice of alpha yields a different probability mass function, right? So, if you go back to your graph, what's going to happen? These guys will go like this, boom, 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 something like this, right? So, there's all kinds of different uh, 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 different possibilities here, and um, the collection of all probability distributions for different values of the parameter is called a family of probability distributions. Okay, so now we do more examples. So let's say we observe the gender, so whether it's male or female, of each newborn child at a hospital until a boy is born. Okay, sounds a bit similar to an example we already had with, the, with this with this guy. Anyway, so um, let's say we assume that the successive births are independent. Okay? And let's furthermore say our random variable x is defined as the number of births that we observe. OK? 
Okay? Then <clears throat> the probability, let's say, of this, so the, of, uh, so the probability of observing a boy, let's call it P. Okay? Then we know the probability of observing a girl will be 1 minus P. Okay, we change alpha to P now. <coughs> so then the probability of seeing three, so let's, let me observe three births before we see a boy, right? So the third uh, birth is a boy will then be the probability of a girl times the probability of a girl times the probability of a boy, right? The probability of a boy we know is P, right? The probability of a girl we know is 1 minus P, and 1 minus P times 1 minus P is 1 minus P squared, right? So, actually, our probability mass function looks like this, right? We have 1 minus P to the X minus 1 times P, for X being 1 all the way to infinity. We can do this for the boys girls, then we can do it for any other, any other, uh, exam any, uh, everything else too, right? We could do it for uh, resource factor positive, right, for blood type. Would then P would be 0.85. Okay. Questions about this? Yes. Sir. yes sir. Would you please explain the second step of the uh, P2? This? Yeah. Ah, okay. So <clears throat> we said, so remember our independence. We said if, so we say these both are independent, right? That's our assumption. If the first one was a girl, it does not have any effect on the second one. Right, so once we know, so the probability, in this case, the probability of B, in this case, the probability of B given girl, that the first one was a girl, the probability of it does not change, will just be the probability of B. Right, given that the first one was a girl, it doesn't change anything, right? So that's why we can simply multiply these guys. Right, we say, what's the probability of the first one being a girl and the second one being a boy? That's just, be, that's just the probability of the first one being a girl times the second one being a boy. And, that's, and now the probability of being a boy was P. Okay, so that's why we put the P here. And it can only be a girl or a boy, right? So if the probability of being a boy is P, then the probability of being a girl has to be 1 minus p. Right? That's exactly what we said here in this case with the alpha 1 minus alpha. Right? Because they sum to 1. Right? It can only be a girl, boy or a girl. Okay, so that's it. That's it. So you just take multiply these two probabilities out, and there you are. And then, okay, you can, you know, the third case is okay, what's the probability of x being 3? which is that you observe three births, would be, there's only one possible outcome in this, would be girl, girl, boy. Right, then you do probability of girl, probability of girl, probability of boy. Since they're independent, you could just take the individual probability. Uh, we want to compute the probability that the observed value of x is at most x. <clears throat> okay, so this is formal definition. So then we use the community distribution function. The community distribution function, or CDF, or capital F of x of a discrete random variable x with a probability mass function p of x is defined for every number x by this is the probability of our random variable having being smaller or equal to some specific number x. And how do we calculate that, this value? We just sum over all the, the probabilities y. And what is y? y is always smaller or equal to x. I mean, it's a bit slightly formal, slightly formal definition uh, for any number, blah, will be at most x, yeah. So I think we will do this in, 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 in one of your examples, and then it becomes clear, I think. <clears throat> so let's say we have our probability mass function of y, okay? Is the number of blood types, uh, this example, I don't know, but let's say these are the specific outcomes. It could be one out of four outcomes. And uh, let's say these are the uh, uh, um, according probabilities. Okay. Now, we can determine this 
commutative, uh, what's it called, commutative distribution function f, capital F of y, by saying f of 1 will be what? Will be the probability of y being small or equal to 1. Right? If it's small or equal to 1, which is we will hear what's, which cases apply. Small or equal to 1 is just this guy, right? So, aha, uh -huh. there we are, open form. Then we say f of 2 is what? f of 2 is the probability of this y guy being small or equal to 2, right? What do we have here? So, could, so this y could be 1 or 2, right? So we check it out. So we say, ah, could be 0.4, could be 0.3. So we sum across these guys. There we are. Right? So what we do, we say, okay, what's the probability up to here? What's the probability up to here? What's the probability up to here? Up to there, right? We just sum. In the end, we will end up with 1 because the sum of all probabilities will just end up, will just equal 1, right? So uh, what's this guy? Ah, okay, so so let's say you have f of 2.7, right? So y is supposed to be smaller than or equal to 2.7, right? But in our case, we just have 2 and 3 and so on and so forth, right? So it doesn't really make sense. So that corresponds to the same as 2, right? We round down. We don't round up because we say it's supposed to be smaller or equal to 2.7, right? So this is the same as smaller or equal to 2. And then we, so then we can write this thing nicely. We can write it up like this. Okay. So now we can make a little graph. Right? This is our commutative distribution function. So the probability is the probability of the, uh, of y being smaller than a specific number. One, two, three, four. Make sense? Um, if you have decimals like 2.7 or 3.999, yes. isn't that examples of conditional probability instead of discrete? Because those aren't discrete values. That's ah, you mean continuous? Yeah. Yes, okay, sure. But, uh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> I mean, this is just a. Uh, uh, well, actually, no, not necessarily. I mean, you could, for example, I give you a. I give you a. So 1.1. 1. 1. 1. 1. These are the, the number of courses that a student has selected. This is the uh, number of uh, uh, students registered in, these num in, in, in this number of courses, and that's the probability of those, right? So now, how would we calculate the average? We would just say, okay, one guy, uh, so 150 guys have one course, so we want to know the average number of courses, right? So we would say, okay, one times 150 plus Two times four and a half, three times this guy, four times this guy, and we add all these guys up, and we divide by the total number of students. That's how we calculate the mean. Now, we can do this, or from our definition, what can we do? We can simply calculate the probabilities of these individual, uh, 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 of the number of courses, and then say, okay, one times p of one, two times plus two times p of two, and so on and so forth. Right, so this corresponds exactly to our formula where we said we take the outcome times its probability and then we sum. Okay, so that's that. So what are we doing here? So actually it means the mean value of x is actually a weighted average of the possible values. And those weights are the probability of those values. Okay, it's a weighted average. So we say how important, let's say, is this specific guy actually? Listen, this, so most students have five courses around you. So uh, that's why it has the highest probability, and then you know we, we, we can't multiply with that probability. It has the highest weight. That's the weight average. <clears throat> okay. So um, ah, so do we still want to continue here? We have fifteen minutes, right? Yeah. Okay, so then we, we uh, this may be the last thing for today. So let's see. So often we will be interested in the expected value of some function x rather than x itself. Okay, what can we do here? So let's say uh, x is the number of cylinders of the engine of a car that need to be repaired. Okay. The cost of the repair is related to x by some other function. Okay, it's not just x itself, it's a different function. It looks like a quadratic function. Now, um, x is a random variable, but h of x is also a random variable. 
Now, let's say, oops, let's say we call h of x as y. Then the probability mass functions of x and y are given as this. So here we have, you know, if it's uh, uh, four cylinders, six cylinders, eight cylinders, that's the probability of these guys. And now we can just plug this x into our, into, into our function and obtain these new values. Okay, h of x we said is y, right? So these are our new outcomes. So if we do 4 times 3 plus 0 0.4 times 4 squared plus 20, whatever, we get 40. Right? If we put this guy in here for x, then we get this y. Okay, and similarly for the other guys. The properties do not change. Okay, so now we have these two guys, right? So <clears throat> what do we want to do here? So now we want to calculate the mean, right? So what do we do? Let's see. So we calculate, we want to calculate the expectation of y, which is the expectation of this function of x. And what did we learn about this expectation? We take the outcome times its probability and we sum over all possible outcomes. Okay. So in this case, very easy. We just take 40 times 0.5, 56 times 0.3, 76 times 0.2. There we are. Or, as we said, we just take this x, put it into our function h. We take the x, put it into our function h, or h, put this, take this h, and the probabilities, as we said, stay the same. So actually, we just take the function of x and multiply it by the probabilities of x, and then sum over. Okay? So in other words, it's not necessary to determine the probability mass function of y to obtain e of y. Instead, the expected value is a weighted average of the possible function of x rather than x values. Okay, so if y is a function of x, we simply take the function and everything stays the same. Okay, so <clears throat> if the random variable x has a set of possible values d and probability mass function p of x, then the expected value of any function, h of x, denoted by mm -hmm. is computed by this guy. So instead of just putting the x guy here, right, this was our original, we just put h of x. End of story. So it's very easy. Um, now comes the interesting part. Let's say, and normally, <coughs> this h of x, let's say it's a linear function of x. What do we mean by linear function? <laughs> linear function means that you have a coefficient, let's call this coefficient A, and it has a bias or offset, which we call B. Okay? This is, any linear function is of this form. Okay? Linear in the sense, so this, so this guy is not a linear function. <coughs> Why? Because we square the x. If there would be a 3 here, it's a cubic function, and so on and so forth. Right? But this guy, everybody knows linear function, right? <laughs> Alright, anyway, so let's say this y is a linear function of x. Okay? So linear function is just these guys, right? So, so if this is x and this is y, then this is a linear function of x, right? So let's say this is a linear function of x. Now the question is, what happens to the expectation of x if we just don't put e of x, but we put e of ax plus b? Pardon? So we, let's say we have a random variable, x. We multiply it by a, and then we add another number b. That's what we're doing here. Yeah? That's what it says. So we take a linear function of x. Yes? So the question is, what happens to the expected value? Okay, that's what we're going to find out now. Actually, it says already, right? It says that the expected value of x will be scaled by a, so will be also multiplied by a, and will also be shifted by b. Okay? And uh, now we go to the proof. So as I said, don't worry about these proofs too much. You know, this is just for your own excitement. So, so remember our formula. Our formula was, where is it? Our formula was just this guy, right? We take x, 
We take the outcome, multiply its probability, and sum over all possible outcomes. Right? Now we do the same here, right? except that now we don't just have x, but we have ax plus b. Okay, so we just plug, instead of x, we just plug this guy now. Okay, nothing has changed. Now, let's think about this. So, what do we know about these sums? These sums, well, what's the next step actually here? Ah, first of all, we break these guys up. Okay, so we can multiply this guy, so we multiply this out. We multiply this guy with that guy, multiply this guy with that guy. Okay, so then we have two, okay, so this step does two things few things at the same time. So let's see what we have here. So the first thing is we multiply these guys out. Okay, so we multiply them out. So we have, we end up with A, let's just think of this guy being inside. So we have AX times P of X, and then we have B times P of X. Okay, now if you have a sum, what's this sum goes over all possible values X, right? So, if you have a sum, and it goes over possible values x, you can take out, you can bring to the front any other thing that you multiply. So let's say we have the sum of ax, and you sum over, I don't know, some values x, I don't know, n or something, that is the same as a, you sum x. Right? You can pull the a out. You do the sum, and multiply with the a later on. Okay, and that's exactly what's happening here. So the a, and when can you do this? The question is, when can you pull these things out? You can pull it out if it does not depend on x. Right, a in our case is just some, some random number, right? Just, we're done. So what do we see here? So what's this guy? Only this guy. Yeah, that's our original formula for the expectation of x, right? So this is, guys, just expectation of x. What do we have in front? So we scale our original expectation of x with a. Now, what's this guy? We sum all possible over all possible probabilities. That just gives us one. Exactly. So there we are. So we have a times the expectation of x plus b. So that's the proof of what we just said before. Um, Okay, and these are just two special cases, right? So if we only multiply by a, then the expectation becomes a times expectation of, of, of x. And similarly, if we simply add b, then the expectation of x becomes b, right? And um, how can, you know, what's the intuitive, what's the intuitive explanation here? The intuitive explanation is if we change, for example, from dollars to cents, we multiply everything by 100, right? So then, you know, if you calculate the mean of cents, we'll still st stay in cents, right? And similarly, uh, yeah, so then the unit of the expected value will also be changed. And, um, <clears throat> yeah, and then, so the shifting, I think, is also here. So, um, so then maybe we stop here. So we have some time for questions, so we have some couple of minutes. Any questions about any of the stuff that we talked about today? Class not finished. So as long as the probability of x being a certain number is not zero, it's, um, it's not that no. Ah, yeah, don't worry about it. We'll come to continuous next time. But so in principle, so so make us excuse me, class not finished. So, if you have a discrete uh, a probability mass function, then let's say you have three discrete states, for example, or let's say two, like in a binomial, right? Then each of those two states will have a specific probability. Yeah. If you have a discontinuous, right? Then you don't have just this is just discrete thing. Then your probability distribution will look something like this. Oh, could be a different form, but you know, then you know there is a for every. For every possible uh, value there, there will be uh, a, a probability assigned. Any other questions? Well, that's your question, right? <coughs> yes? You just said um, for any... Yeah, okay, for every interval. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. 
You're right. You're right. Okay, if there's no further questions, then thank you and see you on Wednesday. <coughs>